Three Penn Central Jeeps, led by number 2266, pull a Delaware and Hudson train, possibly the RW6, into Hudson Yard in this mid-1970s photo. This train is bound for the DNH's Hudson Yard, which is on the northeast side of Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. From Hudson Yard, this train will continue south via the Wilkesbury Connecting Railroad to the Penn Central Line, eventually reaching Sunbury and the Penn Central Buffalo Line. Penn Central Power was frequently used in pusher service on northbound DNH trains bound for Lanesboro. There, the Penn Central Power would wait for the next southbound DNH freight and work in pusher service. When southbound RW6 arrived at Lanesboro, the DNH units would uncouple and move to the rear of the train, serving as the pushers. The PC units would serve as a head in power as the trains moved south over the Ararat Mountain and through the Lackawanna and Wyoming Valleys to reach Hudson. The DNH power, which had served as the pushers, would then be ready to pull the next northbound DNH train. The Delaware and Hudson acquired the Penn Central Wilkesbury branch as far as Sunbury with the creation of Conrail in 1976. The track it's shown in the photo today is now the property of Norfolk Southern and serves as the river line to the Buffalo line in Sunbury. In its heyday, the Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania area was a very complicated area railroad-wise, with the CNJ, the Lehigh Valley, the Delaware and Hudson, the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Lackawanna, the Erie, and the Lackawanna and Wyoming Valley Laurel Line, there were tracks seemingly everywhere. From its northernmost terminus of Montreal, Quebec, Canada, the DNH pretty much ended in Wilkesbury with a paper company called the Wilkesbury Connecting Railway. Jointly owned with the Pennsylvania Railroad, it was essentially used to connect the two roads and bypass the congested downtown. By the early 1970s, the DNH's main yard in town was known as the Hudson Yard. This was originally part of the Wilkesbury and Eastern, which was a subsidiary of the New York, Susquehanna, and Western. After the WBNE was abandoned, this section was sold to become the Wilkesbury Connecting Railway. Amazingly, while the Penn C and the DNH are now gone, the New York, Susquehanna, and Western still operates to this day. The Delaware and Hudson, Pennsylvania division itself ran from the connection with the Pennsylvania Railroad at Buttonwood Yard in Wilkesbury to the Erie Railroad's main line near Lanesboro and north to the DNH's Susquehanna division at Nineveh, New York. Today, what's left of the Hudson Yard is a forest of new growth trees, but the main line itself is still intact. We've just turned right off of Cleveland Street and onto South Oak Street, and we're now looking at a small slice of what's left of the Delaware and Hudson's Hudson Yard. For a comparison, here's a picture of what this grade crossing looked like back around 1967.
On this day, the sizable Roanoke, Virginia to Binghamton, New York train 10Z moves northbound through town. Unusual about today's train is that it's all general freight without a single waste container to be found.
Moving back to last year, a windy November 29 to be exact, I caught an impressive southbound Train 11Z with an equally impressive locomotive lash-up to match. Today's soup consists of six high-horsepower locomotives, which includes an EMD SD70 ACC leading a DC Jeevo, along with two Dash 9s and two AC44 C6Ms that were rebuilt from the Dash 9 series.
The Delaware and Hudson Canal Company was incorporated in 1823 to construct a canal between the Delaware River and the Hudson River to transport anthracite coal to New York City. The ground was broken for the DNH Canal in July 1825, and the canal opened between Rondout Creek near Kingston, New York, and Honesdale, Pennsylvania in October of 1828. To obtain anthracite coal, the DNH constructed the Delaware and Hudson Gravity Railroad in the Music Mountains near Carbondale between 1826 and 1829. Towards the late 1800s, the DNH realized that railroads were the future of bulk transportation and the company began investing in stock and trackage. The canal carried its last loads of coal in 1898 and was subsequently drained and sold. The Jefferson Railroad was chartered in 1864 with the goal of constructing a line between Carbondale and the Erie Railroad's main line at Lanesboro. The line was financed and constructed by the Erie Railroad in 1869 through 1872. In return for gaining trackage rights over the DNH's Gravity Railroad, the DNH gained trackage rights over the Jefferson Railroad, providing an important connection to Scranton and Wilkesbury. The line was extended north to Nineveh, New York, to form the DNH's 93-mile-long Pennsylvania Division, which halted primarily anthracite coal from the Lackawanna and Wyoming Valleys in Pennsylvania to markets in upstate New York, New England, and Canada. In 1964, the Norfolk and Western wanted to acquire the Wabash and the Nickel Plate Railroads. The Interstate Commerce Commission informed them that to purchase the two roads, they would also have to purchase the Erie Lackawanna and the Delaware and Hudson. This is a scenario that preceded the Penn Central one in 1968. Both were placed into Dureco, a holding company owned by the NNW. After the Hurricane Agnes destroyed much of the Erie Lackawanna main line west of Binghamton, New York, and following the bankruptcy of numerous railroads in the 1970s, including the Erie Lackawanna and the DNH, the Norfolk and Western lost control of the Dureco stock. Erie Lackawanna petitioned for and was included in the formation of Conrail while the DNH was allowed to become an independent railroad. In 1980, Conrail sold the former Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Main Line from Binghamton, New York to Scranton, Pennsylvania to the Delaware and Hudson. As it was a much more flat and direct route to Scranton, the DNH opted to abandon the Pennsylvania division between Carbondale and the connection with the Erie Lackawanna at Brent, just east of Lanesboro, in 1982. The remainder of the Pennsylvania Division from Brant to Nineveh Junction, New York, was used for overheight vehicles, often carrying massive steam turbines from General Electric's Schenectady facility. But the remainder of the Penn Division was, too, abandoned after the Belden Hill Tunnel was enlarged in 1986 on the DNH Susquehanna Division between Binghamton and Schenectady, which allowed the DNH to route traffic over the ex Erie Lackawanna trackage from Jefferson Junction northward. The only Pennsylvania Division trackage that remains in use today is from Carbondale South through the towns of Mayfield, Peckville, Archibald, and Dixon City. It's owned by the Pennsylvania Northeastern Regional Railroad Authority and is operated by the Delaware-Lackawanna Short Line. Significant portions of the Delaware and Hudson Penn Division between Simpson and the New York State Line have been converted into the Delaware and Hudson Rail Trail. The abandoned 1904 Staruka Creek Bridge, not to be confused with the Erie Railroad Staruka Viaduct in Lanesboro, was renovated for use by pedestrians, cyclists, and horseback riders in 2019 through 2020. The project was funded by the Pennsylvania Recreational Trails Program, the Federal Highway Administration, and the State Bureau of Recreation and Conservation. June 22, 2024 was a red-letter date in local railroad history. Besides the fact that it was hot, very hot, so hot in fact that the display in my car registered 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Over on the regional Reading, Blue Mountain, and Northern, the mighty T1-2102 made its first trip into the Wilkes-Barre area with a lengthy excursion train with hundreds of passengers on board and hundreds more people giving chase trackside. I personally don't do large rail fan gaggles very often with the traffic, the chaos, the people getting into your shots and you getting into theirs. And then there's the always present discourtesy that comes from large crowds of people. Despite these discouragements, I managed to make it to Coxon Yard so that I could see the fast freighters number 5018 and 5019 guiding the big steam engine down and into town. Unfortunately, the railroad ran early and by the time that I got into the yard, all that was left was a parking lot full of empty cars. The silver lining that day was that another locomotive celebrity had come through the area. 
the Lehigh Valley Heritage Unit number 8104, what I affectionately call the Valley Girl, was the mid-train distributed power unit on the day southbound train 11Z. The zipper had two powered locos and a unit dead in tow up front with a long train of waste containers and general freight trailing from behind. And after an agonizing wait in the hot midday sun, the Z finally appeared from the forest and threw Hudson on its way to Roanoke, Virginia.
Check out that two-bay covered hopper. That's the CLSX number 5000, the class unit of the Cargill Incorporated Salt Division's hopper fleet. The 5000 is a plate C AAR type C112 Trinity two-bay that's used for hauling salts and other minerals. We did a deep dive into the operations of the Cargill salt mines of upstate New York and the railroad that hauls it a few videos back. One thing most of the hard anthracite coal railroads had in common in their early diesel years were their black or lack of colored locomotives. As the second generation of the diesel locomotives came in, many began to brighten up their liveries with an array of color schemes. Roads like the Delaware and Hudson with its dark blue and later dynamic lightning stripe blue and gray, the Redding's dark green and later green and yellow, including the rare Beeline service slogan on the sides, and the eccentric Lehigh Valley whose exotic and varied paint schemes seemingly sampled every color from the rainbow. All of that changed in 1976 when every railroad's color became blue, and that's including our beloved d &H. My earliest train memories captured a little bit of Conrail in its early state of being, a collection of deteriorated track and locomotives from various bankrupt Northeast railroads. Conrail's dress blue paint scheme had yet to displace the various paint schemes of the bankrupt carriers that were brought under the Conrail umbrella, the largest component of which was the Penn Central with its black locomotives, hence what became known as Conrail's black and blue years. The Penn Central was the biggest component of Conrail, and indeed, Conrail was set up to be little more than a big blue Penn Central, but with good track and equipment and without those pesky competitors siphoning away all of its traffic. Conrail still failed though, losing $1 million per day just like the Penn Central before it until the systematic issues were finally addressed. The Jersey Central, as it was usually called, contributed some important secondary lines and industrial trackage to Conrail but its main lines were commuter traffic heavy and Conrail offloaded them to the New Jersey Transit keeping trackage rights for any freight access. If you're not familiar with the New Jersey Transit, it's New Jersey's state surface transportation agency that absorbed the operation of commuter trains on various New Jersey rail lines that were originally part of the Conrail system. The Erie Lackawanna was a last minute addition to Conrail after the original plan to have another profitable railroad acquire the EL fell through due to the organized labor's refusal to make concessions on work rules, that railroad being the Chessie system. Conrail from day one viewed and treated the Erie Lackawanna as surplus, abandoning much of its main lines and diverting traffic wherever possible to alternate, usually ex Penn Central routes. A notable exception was the Southern Tier line across New York State which the state encouraged the retention of by offering financial assistance to Conrail to fix up track and signals. This line also figured prominently in the alternative fig leaf of competition provided for the essential rail monopoly for the ports of New York and Boston created by the birth of Conrail, that being the expansion of the Delaware and Hudson via extensive trackage rights. Van Etten Junction on the Lehigh Valley Railroad was located just south of the little town of Van Etten, New York. The Lehigh Valley Main Line pushed north, railroad west, from Sayre to the junction where the freight main veered off to the northwest, railroad west, to Geneva, and the passenger main veered off to the northeast, also railroad west, toward Ithaca, New York. Both lines were in place and in use by the Lehigh Valley until Conrail was formed in 1976. The freight main to Geneva was immediately abandoned by Conrail. In fact, I don't believe that Conrail ever actually operated a single regular train over that line. Whether it did or not, the tracks were torn up immediately after 1976. The freight route sought easier grades before the freight and passenger routes rejoined again at the Geneva Junction. Moving further west after Rochester Junction, the valley crossed the B&O at p &L Junction where there was also a connection with the old New York Central Peanut Line. Depew was a junction with the branch to suspension bridge which is where the Lehigh Valley operated the Maple Leaf between New York and Toronto, Canada. Moving back to Van Etten, the passenger main is still in place between the old junction and Ithaca, New York and it also extends north of Ithaca to the power plant there. This line was still in use by the Norfolk Southern in 2018 which brings us to the main subject of this video.
That portion of the Lehigh Valley's former Ithaca branch that was formerly operated by Norfolk Southern is now operated by the new Ithaca Central Railroad, which is a newly formed subsidiary of the short-line operator Watco. On November 8, 2018, a filing was made with the Surface Transportation Board where Watco had requested an exemption that allowed the Ithaca Central to operate as a Class 3 railroad on approximately 48.8 miles of track between Sarah, Pennsylvania and Lansing, New York, which is just north of Ithaca. Tracks were first laid by the Geneva, Ithaca, and Sarah in 1875 and later became part of the Lehigh Valley Railroad. The current main customers are the Cargill Salt Plant in Lansing and a Waverly company that receives plastic pellets. The agreement extends about four miles beyond Ithaca to the troubled Cayuga power plant. The coal-burning power plant was steeped in controversy for years as the new owners had spent years unsuccessfully seeking approval to convert it to natural gas. Don't know if they've been successful yet or not. At the time, the 325 megawatt generating station was one of just two coal plants still operating in New York, where state government was working to end all coal-fired power generation by 2020. The Ithaca Central was the 40th railroad in the stable of Kansas-based Watco, a non-operating holding company which, at the time, controlled at least 38 Class 3 short lines as well as the Class 2 Wisconsin and Southern. We're here at American Rock Salt, which is located within the yard limits of Taylor. I've said in past videos that it's rare for the salt spur to be devoid of any rail cars, loaded or empty. Today, it's the day after Christmas, December 26, 2014, and we've just arrived as the local switching crew, which I believe was symbol the D11 at the time, is pulling the empties from the spur. Once clear of the main line switch, the Canadian Pacific Jeep shoves the cars past the powered switch at control point 672 and proceeds south onto the Taylor siding, which today is part of the Taylor yard limit, and into Taylor yard where the empties will move north on the next Binghamton bound train 259, where they'll probably be handed off to the Norfolk Southern to move west over the Southern Tier Line to the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad and their salt mines in Retsoft, New York. During business hours, the day-to-day -day unloading operations happening at American Rock Salt is a pretty interesting procedure to watch. First, various mobile conveyors are moved into position for the proper distribution of the salt. Once in position, the salt is bottom dumped from the loaded covered hoppers where it travels across the conveyor belt pipeline and is dropped into place in large mounds where a payloader smooths out the top before the salt is tarped with the protection from rain, snow, and other man-made and non-man-made elements. Perhaps even more interesting than watching the unloading of the salt cars is watching the movement of them. At least it was interesting back in 2015. Although the salt spur is located within the Taylor yard limits, the railroad does not provide individual car spotting services to the business. When individual cars need to be spotted into position, that assignment was the task of another earth mover which gently walks the cars into position for unloading and eventual pickup. Somewhere between 2015 when I recorded these scenes and 2020 when I took these photos, the earth moving machines were replaced by a somewhat automated car moving system. A thick steel cable attached to a giant winch on one end, an attachment piece on the other end that's wound around a large pulley. So now when a car or multiple cars need to be brought into position, a new winch and pulley system does the job once accomplished by rubber tires and diesel power. Another metal marvel that I caught while on the spur is the southbound Binghamton, New York to Enola, Pennsylvania daily. Train 11Z, now under Norfolk Southern ownership, is making its daily descent behind a DC Jeevo, an AC Jeevo, and a soon-to-be rebuilt Dash 9. And while you're watching this long train pass by, take note of the green Bay Line high top gondola, about 20 to 30 cars behind the locomotives, and the double stack waste containers in the middle a portent of things to come in the days, months, and years ahead. And a little disclaimer, I apologize for the awful wind noise as this train is rolling by. At the time, I did not have a windscreen for my microphone, so what you hear is unfortunately what you get.
We started this salty little adventure at the new American rock salt deposit in Taylor, but a few videos back you learned that it was on the site of the former Pennsylvania Railroad Buttonwood Yard where my rail fan adventures in the Northeast started. That's also where American Rockstar got its start too. At least I think it was. While I can't say exactly when they took up roots in Buttonwood, I can remember the Salt Man being in Buttonwood as far back as the 1990s. Whenever it was that they arrived, in 2004 they greatly expanded their operations in Buttonwood. It was a dual operation back then, salt and scrap. American rock salt on one side and the DMS scrap metal shredder on the other. The salt deposit received inbound loaded covered hoppers just like they do today, while the shredder received inbound empty gondola cars that were loaded with the scrap metal pieces. And just like up at Taylor in 2015, the cars were spotted about the siding with the payloader. These photos that I took 20 years ago in 2004 show the new scales that had just been put in. Note that the ballast hasn't even been dropped yet. Also in this photo, you can see the gross weight display in the upper left corner. This scale weighed empty and loaded gondola cars. Also visible from these photos is the swing out gate that the payloader used to come out and push the cars into position. And one last thing to point out about this scale is that locomotives were never allowed on it. Now we take a look at the inbound and outbound truck scale located at American Rock Salt in Taylor Yard today. Similar to the rail car scale at Buttonwood, this scale weighs the inbound empty trucks and then again once they're loaded and outbound. Cargill de-icing technology operates one of its three mines in Lansing, New York, providing customers with de-icing technology and road salt that saves lives, enhances commerce, and reduces environmental impact. Cargill acquired the mine in 1970 and annually produces approximately 2 million tons of road salt that is shipped to more than 1,500 locations throughout New York State and the Northeast United States. In 1915, John Clute organized the Rock Salt Corporation on Portland Point in Lansing. In 1916, the shaft was sunk to 1,500 feet, but the salt was of poor quality. By 1918, the mine was still not producing well and was shut down. In 1921, Frank Bolton and John Shannon bought the mine and further sank the shaft to 2,000 feet to a better vein of salt, which was 99% pure. The operation was managed by Frank Bolton and then his wife Lucy when he passed away. The Cayuga Rock Salt Company managed the Cayuga mine until 1970 when Cargill purchased the mining rights. Cargill modernized the mine with new belt lines for salt haulage, ventilation updates, a new shaft, and new diesel-powered equipment. Currently, the mine is advancing north up Cayuga Lake and is approximately a mile east past Tughannock Point. The salt is mainly sold in the road de-icing market, but is also sold under the Diamond Crystal name as residential de-icing salt. The Finger Lakes region are a group of 11 long, narrow, roughly north-south lakes located directly south of Lake Ontario in an area called the Finger Lakes region in New York. This region straddles the northern and transitional edge of the northern Allegheny Plateau, known as the Finger Lakes Uplands and Gorges ecoregion and the Ontario Lowlands ecoregion of the Great Lakes Lowlands. The geological term Finger Lakes refers to a long, narrow lake in an over-deepened glacial valley, while the proper name Finger Lakes goes back to the late 19th century. Cayuga and Seneca Lakes are among the deepest in the United States, measuring 435 feet and 618 feet respectively with bottoms well below sea level. Though none of the lakes widths exceed 3.5 miles, Seneca Lake is 38.1 miles long and at 66.9 square miles is the largest in total area. The Ithaca Central Railroad reporting mark ITHR is a 48.8 mile long short line railroad operating in New York and Pennsylvania that's owned by Watco. The Ithaca Central leases and operates the Norfolk Southern-owned Ithaca Secondary from Sarah, Pennsylvania, which is the Norfolk Southern Interchange, to Ludlowville, New York. The railroad began operations on December 8, 2018, serving its primary customer, the Cargill Cayuga Rock Salt Mine in Lansing, New York, although the railroad can haul various commodities such as salt, coal, plastics, and magnesium chloride. The railroad uses two ex-Union Pacific EMD SD40-2 SD45 car body locomotives 
WAMX numbers 4247 and WAMX numbers 4248. On January 30, 2019, the Ithaca Central received a third EMD SD40-2, WAMX 4241. One unique characteristic that immediately jumped out at me on the leading dash 2 are those DeFasco flexi-coil trucks. DeFasco trucks are commonly found on Elko and Montreal Locomotive Works diesels of Canadian heritage, such as those on our local Delaware Lackawanna short line. When I arrived in Ithaca, the crew had not yet come on duty, so I ventured further north to Lansing to get shots of the salt mine. And wouldn't you know it, as I was making my way south back into town, here came the Ithaca Central northbound on its way to where I just came from with empties to be loaded up with more salt. When I got back to home base, I was greeted to the nightly evening local switcher switching out of all places the American Rock Salt Spur. Notable is the power, an EMD AC powered locomotive and a Dash 944CW that's well on its way to becoming one. The trailing locomotive number 9216 has a unique place along on our journey. Can you remember when it showed up a few videos back? If not, here's a little refresher for you. You remember this locomotive, don't you? She was built in April of 1998 as the DC Propulsion Dash 9 40 CW number 9216 and rebuilt as the AC Propulsion C6M that we see here more than 20 years later in March of 2021. Today, she's being assisted by the 9928, a Dash 944 CW that will soon be rebuilt into a C6M and an SD60E a Norfolk Southern exclusive locomotive that was rebuilt from an EMD SD60, likely dead in tow. The Norfolk Southern switching crew performs the same switching maneuvers that we saw Canadian Pacific doing the day after Christmas almost 10 years ago back in 2014. And while the power may change, the people may change, and in today's case, even the railroad has changed. The work of freight trains moving ice-melting crystals to market remains a salty endeavor.